not often that people laugh at the, the films made here, but that was, yeah, that raised a few uh, smirks, didn't it? Um, well, look, first of all, thank you very much, first of all, to Mrs. McCain for that introduction. Um, she laid out very clearly the global nature of the issue that we're about to talk about for the next hour. Uh, thank you for, to Peter for inviting me back to Halifax. Um, thank you for all being here. And Peter gave me a, a little word of advice before uh, the start of this. He said, don't do your job, <laughs> which um, I don't think anyone's ever said that to me before. But uh, what, he, what he was getting at was um, we want you, as many of you, to participate in this session as possible. So I'm, I'm going to try and keep my questions to our esteemed panelists brief. And um, I'm laying it out there. So I'd like you all to think of questions you want to, to pose. And I will uh, try and moderate between you rather than uh, take up all your time posing the questions as I would normally do. So without further ado, let me introduce our four esteemed panelists who are going to talk about food, food security, and what the war in Ukraine has meant for Ukraine, but for the world more broadly, and how to address those issues. First of all, uh, Hannah Hopko is a former Ukrainian MP. She was head of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Ukrainian Parliament. She's also the co-founder of the International Centre for Ukrainian Victory. And I think she's probably only member of this panel who actually has a foodstuff named after her. Ooh. <laughs> well, I, I think I'm right. I didn't ask the other panelists. But uh, she, 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 did an, uh, just a, she, she did an interview with National Public Radio uh, in which she talked about her own experience, her family's experience. And a sausage shop in Buffalo, New York, has named a sausage after her, the H.H. H. Bush sausage. So that's quite a distinction. Yeah, there we go. Um, next to her, Senator Chris Coons from Delaware, who needs no introduction to the, the Halifax family. He's very much part of it. Uh, he's someone who's been interested in food security for a long time, passing legislation. He has a new bill he's introduced just in the last couple of weeks uh, with uh, two of his Republican colleagues, the Foundation for International Food Security Act. Um, but his interest in it goes far beyond that. We'll talk to you about that, Senator. Um, Pastor Esther Ibanga, uh, a distinguished pastor from Nigeria, but she is also the founder of the Women Without Walls Initiative, which is an NGO which has been trying to foster cross-community peace and reconciliation between ethnic and religious divides in Nigeria. And Mrs. McCain talked about the, the impact that food insecurity has had in, in fostering violence, fostering terror, and perhaps we'll address some of that with you. Uh, Pastor Esther. And uh, to, to the end, last but not least, Johan uh, Bergenas, who is uh, the Senior Vice President of Oceans at the World Wildlife Fund in the United States. Uh, uh, you have long experience in dealing with national security questions, but um, I'm gonna, we're going to dabble in why wildlife is on the panel a bit later. But I'm going to start, and I think it's appropriate we start, uh, with Ukraine itself and with Hannah. And, and I know you have a historical view of this, Hannah, because food and the way food has been used to punish your country has a long history, doesn't it? I want to perhaps put into context how you view food and how it has become a weapon in this war against your country. Thank you for these important questions. And I'm really very thankful to Peter for actually all the conference dedicated to victory of Ukraine. And especially when we are talking about weaponization of food, for us it means weaponization of hunger. Because um, um, just November 16 of 1933, when Stalin man made famine against Ukraine, when the breadbasket of Europe and our people were just dying because of hunger, because of starvation, and it was really one of the most painful uh, pages in our history because millions of Ukrainians died because of Holodomor as a genocide. And why I mentioned uh, November 16, 1933? Because at that time, unfortunately, the US, instead of punishing Soviet Union, they uh, recognized diplomatically Soviet Union. So actually, the price we paid for not recognition Holodomor as a genocide at that time, for future generations, Ukrainians uh, were unfortunately 
killed and actually we lost this chance to build a strong nation. And actually the League of Nations at that time was also kept silent instead of acting. And only 90 years after, because next week in Ukraine is a week of commemoration of 90th anniversary of Holodomor as a genocide. Yeah. And I'm really very thankful to James Bazan, who is here sitting with us, who is a Canadian legislator who has 2008 submitted a legislation and Canada recognized Holodomor as a genocide. And it's said that only last year, European Parliament only last year, after the new genocide Russia started to commit against us, European Parliament and Bundestag recognized Holodomor as a genocide. Why I'm uh, um, keeping attention on history? Why I'm telling about this uh, weaponization of hunger against Ukraine in last century? Because uh, there are some lin linkages between Holodomor as a genocide, then Holocaust from Stalin to Hitler, and then also, I think, uh, this unpunished evil now is committing another genocide, because there is no difference between Soviet, between Soviet Union and current Russian Federation totalitarian regime. Because they are using uh, food, they are using hunger, because at that time, during Holodomor genocide, this was deliberately against Ukraine. This was an act of destroying the Ukrainian nation. Now, weaponization of hunger means millions of people suffering in Africa, Asia, and why it's happening? Because we expected that NATO presence in the Black Sea before the full-scale war will stay and defend freedom of navigation. But actually what we see, the strongest military alliance in the world just withdraw its presence from the Black Sea. And now Ukraine export potential declined for 40%. Russia, after withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Initiative this July 17, they destroyed by constant military uh, um, missile attacks on ports, terminals. They destroyed 300,000 tons of grain. Can we imagine how many people could receive this food? And the prices in Cambodia, in Vietnam for rice just go, uh, go up because of this uh, uh, situation in the Black Sea. So I think the lessons we should learn. And this is why victory for Ukraine means liberation of all our territories. Because Ukraine, 20 years ago, we produced uh, food for 40 million of uh, people worldwide. Before the full-scale war, Ukraine was able to produce for 400 million of population. So without Russian invasion and Russian war, Ukrainians, our farmers, are able to feed uh, there are different estimations, but around 1 billion of people. So this is why liberation of all our territories, demining of the territories, supporting farmers during the war, this is key for Ukraine to keep feeding the world. But the key is here, and why I'm here. Because, uh, just to finish, because um, uh, the video which, which started the, Halif the 15th Halifax and the end of uh, our soldiers who are now in the heaven, our heroes, it reminds me about uh, James Mace, a famous American researcher who helped US Congress with evidences and data also to contribute a lot to recognition of Holodomor as a genocide. And he wrote a book, I was chosen by your death to tell the truth. So I think the most important is to plant the seeds of truth. Mm -hmm. Truth about Holodomor at that time and, and punishment evil and how it's progressed in 21st century. And now on behalf of those heroes who are not with us anymore, I want also to express the sense of urgency. It's already 10 years of Russian ongoing aggression. Almost two years of Russia committing genocide. And uh, Mr. Uh, the father of uh, genocide classification according to the UN 1948 convention, so all what Russia is doing in Ukraine, ecocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, it's uh, also uh, forceful uh, uh, displacement of Ukrainian kids. It's all is genocide. And I do believe the world will not need another 90 years, like with Holodomor genocide, to recognize and to punish. So this is why we demand tribunal, we demand punishment through confiscation of Russian assets, and of course, reparation in the future.
Otherwise, this evil will prevail in next generations, in other places, in other continents. Thanks very much, Hannah. Um, Senator Coons, a lot there, but I wonder, so much of the debate is about military help for Ukraine, but what can, what more can the West do, can America do to help with these issues of food security, not just the, the demining, the, the very practical help, but making sure the world is fed and making sure that Ukrainian agriculture gets back on its feet? So for Ukraine to win, um, we need to continue our support, not just military equipment being sent to the front lines to the brave Ukrainians who are facing Russian aggression every day, uh, but also investment um, in the economy, in the restoration of the huge agricultural and economic potential, reopening the Black Sea, demining the fields, investing in new agricultural uh, processing facilities. This will have enormous consequences for Ukraine's ability to win and for dozens of countries around the world to have access uh, to sustainable, healthy, and affordable food. As we heard from Director McCain from Cindy in her opening remarks, we are on the verge of uh, one of the biggest global hunger events in modern history. The tragedy of the genocide of the Holodomor is recognized in a memorial on Capitol Hill in Washington, should be recognized in the hearts and histories of every nation and every person here. That we are allowing this to continue again should be unspeakable. And the consequences, not just for the people of Ukraine, but for the dozens of countries fed through the abundance of Ukraine, makes this more urgent than ever. I chair the subcommittee that delivers funding from the United States for humanitarian relief around the world. We are in the middle of a real struggle in Congress over delivering on our president's request for humanitarian assistance. And it's my hope that colleagues of mine, both here and back in Washington, will hear this urgent uh, need for us to continue to lead the global alliance of 50 nations uh, that President Biden and many other leaders around the world have pulled together in response to Ukraine's urgent need and invest not just in military equipment, uh, but in revitalizing the Ukrainian economy. That's what victory will truly mean, is when Ukraine is fully back to its potential and feeding the world. And, and a follow-up just on something that Hannah referred to. She referred to the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which is probably the only deal that's been done with Russia during this war mm. of any consequence. It lasted for a year. It helped feed many countries. The World Food Programme took advantage of it, and a number of African countries were ones that benefited from the grain that was shipped to those countries. But it ended. Russia pulled out of it. I mean, what lessons would you take from that whole experience? Don't trust the Russians to keep their word for anything. Um, frankly, what's happened is the Ukrainians continue to show remarkable uh, tactical innovation, and despite lacking a relevant navy, uh, delivered naval drones and attacked uh, the Black Sea Fleet, which is now withdrawn to the far side of Crimea. Uh, and so there are some exports now resuming. Uh, but frankly, what I would take from that is that um, Russia continues to be aggressive in every possible way without regard for the consequences, not just to the people of Ukraine, but the world, and that we need to sustain our support for Ukraine um, and for their innovation and for the solutions that they're delivering to a hungry world. Thanks very much. Well, that brings us to, to you. Esther, mm -hmm. how in Nigeria are you seeing the effects of the war in Ukraine and specifically the limited exports of grain from Ukraine? What, what, what impact is it having? What are you seeing? Thank you so much, um, James. And I'd like to appreciate Peter and his team for inviting me once again. It's always an honor to be here. Um, I would like to start with um, an adage that is said in Africa, particularly in Nigeria, and that is to describe a situation that is worsening. And that adage is from frying pan to fire. And it's interesting because we saw that in the video, you know, and um, so that typically describes what is going on in Africa right now as a result of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. And I'm also glad that um, Mrs. McCain, in her introductory speech, highlighted you know, the effects in Africa and what is going on. And most of the examples of the countries that are really suffering from it are from Africa. 
you know, and I will speak from Nigeria, but, you know, allow me to share some statistics first, and then I will describe how that translates to the common man, you know, in Africa. So we're told um, from the World Poverty Clock that about 719 million people, which is 9.2% of the world, are poor. And uh, most of children and youths account for 23rd of that world's poor, including women. Out of this figure, extreme poverty is actually concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. We all know that. And 24% of world population, which is about 1.9 million, um, live in fragile contexts. And 1.2 billion people living in 101 developing countries live in poverty. That's the situation of my continent. And so if this was the situation before the Russian aggression in Ukraine, you can imagine what's going on now and how the situation will be. Unfortunately for me, and I'm embarrassed to say this, Nigeria is regarded as the world, world poverty capital of the world. Not because of lack of resources, but the mismanagement of resources, endemic um, corruption, unaccountability, a flawed democratic system that, you know, um, encourages corruption to go on, and so on and so forth. How does that translate to the common man? So I'll give you two examples. Um, in Africa, you can stand by the roadside and buy roasted corn and eat. And it's usually maybe about 10 cents, then that's the cost. Currently, right now, most people cannot even afford that one corn. And so it has to be broken into three pieces and portions sold to the common man to eat. Between the Democratic um, Republic um, of Congo and Gabon, it's a village right now that exists where parents actually take their children there and sell them for food because they can't feed them anymore and they would rather sell. Coming home, um, to me personally, you know, um, there is bread that we buy in my family, and it's part of our breakfast meal. We love it so much. And it's like 3,000 naira, which is equivalent to $3, okay? Right now, it sells for $12, and it's no more part of, you know, our meals. So we have to look at other options. So that's me and maybe the middle class, you would say, that have options. What about the average people that have no options? Over 70 million of, of, of Nigerians live in poverty. And right now, the cliche in Nigeria is let the poor breathe. And they are not breathing. So there are short and um, immediate and long-term consequences of the war that's going on, and Ukraine has to win. For the benefit of the world and for Africa to survive, Ukraine has to win. And all hands must be on deck to ensure that Ukraine wins. Because when Ukraine wins, Africa is winning. The whole world is winning, except, of course, for Russia and probably the Krims. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're very... You're very clear on that, but many African leaders are not, are not taking sides. Mm -hmm. Public opinion seems to, polls seem to suggest that actually a majority of people in African countries do see with moral clarity who is responsible, but actually are reluctant for their governments to take sides. What, why is that? What, what are the consequences? For economic and political reasons. Um, unfortunately, in Africa, we have to separate are leaders from the people. Because um, the leaders most, in most African countries are only interested in themselves, in keeping their political offices, and you know, growing big at the cost of um, the lives of the people, the quality of the lives of the people. You know? So um, they know what is wrong, and they know who is wrong. But of course, they have to keep the um, importation lines open 
for imports to keep on, for grains and wheat to keep on coming in from Russia. Because as it is right now, Russia has already said um, they're only exporting to, quote, friendly countries. So if they think that um, an African country is not friendly, they're definitely going to shut that um, exportation route, and which will, of, of course, compound the situation that is also on ground. And again, the, the, I'm sorry to say, but the Nigerian um, African leaders um, are yet to carry the burden for their people. Mm. Mm. Well, maybe we'll come back to that with Senator Coons, but mm. let's turn to you, Johan, and the World Wildlife Fund. And I know quite a few people have asked you this question, so I'm going to ask you it as well. Why is the World Wildlife Fund at a security and defense conference? What's your role here? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's a fair question. Uh, I think the previous speakers did a great job, Director McCain and others. Um, conservation and natural resource management is absolutely fundamental to good approaches to food security and to getting to the left of conflict. So I think that's the first piece. The second piece is that there's an issue that troubles me tremendously and has done for many, many years, and Senator Coons as well, and that is this notion that even democracies fight over food. And there's one commodity that matters a lot to us in the oceans community, and that is fish. And I bet that a lot of people in this room does not know that 25% of all conflicts during the Cold War between democracies was over fish. So that's a remarkable data point that we need to be careful about. After the Cold War, you add Russia and China to conflictual engagements about this in invaluable commodity, uh, and the risk are increases. And so um, we have tremendous environmentalists, scientists at WWF who took a stab at understanding this and getting to the left of this problem over the last few years uh, by combining climate science, ocean science, and conflict science. Uh, and we are very excited to have released today uh, a new uh, platform, Ocean's Futures, that gives audiences in this room and around the world the potential to understand global hotspots for fish wars 5, 10, 15 years out so we can start having predictive and preventive conversations. And I was really glad to hear uh, General Flynn and others talking about the nature of using the military for preventive action, stamping out ambers that are brewing in this world that is going to lead to food insecurity, that is going to lead to conflict. Um, and so I think that's where WWF has a tremendous role to play. But we need help from members of this community. And I think that's why Peter and others suggested that I join this, this panel today. Thanks very much. I just want to follow up with Senator Coons really on what uh, Esther was saying about the public in African countries seeing what's happening and seeing that Russia has invaded Ukraine, but at the same time, depending on Russia. I mean, how do you deal with that? A couple of concerns. One is that Russia and China um, have invested heavily in disinformation. Uh, Wagner is a significant presence now in the Sahel in several countries. Uh, I would argue a malign presence. Um, but Russian disinformation has spread broadly on the continent the message that if your food prices have gone up, if your fertilizer prices have gone up, it's because of Western sanctions against Russia, not because of Russia's aggression. So the core problem is the United States and its European partners are making your life harder. We need to do a better job at pushing back on that. We also, frankly, need to change the end result. Um, when Ukraine wins, food prices will come back down. Uh, but there's also, to be blunt, um, a tension where Africans look at millions of Ukrainian refugees being welcomed with open arms across Europe, being given housing and education and health care. And they say, well, there's millions of African refugees yeah. who are left to sit in tents out in the desert for decades and aren't welcomed with open arms. So there is a racial uh, distinction made between different types of conflict and refugees that I've heard repeatedly mm -hmm. from friends on the continent who say you're not treating justly the refugees on the continent. Yeah. In August, I went to the Kakama refugee camp in northwestern Kenya. It's been there 25 years. Uh, it was started by the so-called Lost Boys of Sudan. Today, there's a whole new flood of Sudanese refugees, and very few people ever get out of that camp. Um, the World Food Program, because of the increase in the cost of food and fuel 
and the falling off of support has had to cut back support and to sit in that camp with a circle of mothers who were being told that their rations were cut from 100% to 80% to 60% and then to see in concrete terms what that means every week they and their children will get in this camp in the middle of the desert for a quarter million refugees was truly heartrending. In partnership with African countries, we can invest in food security innovation, in modernizing and changing food systems across the continent, across the world. That's part of the point of the legislation you mentioned in your introduction that Senator Graham and I have just introduced, is not to supplant but to complement the work of the World Food Program uh, and the U.S. Mm -hmm. government's initiative, Feed the Future, to bring private sector innovation and investment in, to partner with public sector resources to try and transform food systems so that hunger is a thing of the past. Hannah, someone who, who's out there advocating for Ukraine, when you hear that story from Africa that people understand Russia is responsible, but they depend on Russia, how do you counter that? Or what, for your narrative, what does that mean? Just recently, we invited to uh, Ukraine 35 uh, representatives of uh, countries from Latin America, Africa, Asia to Global South uh, Crimean Platform uh, Forum. So I think it, this was a good opportunity in Kyiv during also visit to Bucha to discuss about sustainable peace. And we, and we produced this manifesto, sustainable peace manifesto with uh, responsibility for aggression for Russia punishment, and also uh, other steps, what needs to be done. And we, because it's about uh, decolonization of Russian history, it's about de-imperialization of Russia, the issues which are uh, very familiar. And uh, talking to African representatives in Kiev about weaponization of energy, weaponization of food, uh, colonization and how to fight with this. So I think Ukraine in the future will become the best country uh, in the world for bridging the communication with uh, representatives of uh, so-called uh, Global South, but countries from Latin America, Africa. Because compared to other European countries, they also have some, uh, how to say, uh, difficult pages in their history. Ukraine, with our fight for decolonization with Russia, it's centuries. Uh, why it's really important to win this time? Because uh, I don't even can imagine. Because um, when my colleague mentioned your story, how now people are sharing bread and trying to survive, so I was honestly about to cry. Because for us in Ukraine, it's reminded all the more when there was the fact of cannibalism, when it's well known facts, when. Um, um, there are many historical um, stories saying like, um, mommy told us to eat her when she died. So it was normal at that time when Ukrainians, uh, to survive, they had, can you imagine? Mommy told us to eat her when she died. And it happened in the breast basket of Europe. Country which was the role to uh, feed the world was uh, starved. And actually, uh, millions of Ukrainians, we don't know exact number, six, eight, 10 millions of Ukrainians who died just because lack of food. So this is why hearing this, for me, I don't really understand why uh, we are not seeing more attackums. Why uh, Germany is not providing us more long uh, range missiles. I don't, we are talking about the uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative. But it's only partial solution. It's, it's not now even solution. Demilitarization of the Black Sea from Russian presence. Why? Uh, the Black Sea is the uh, lake of Russian monopoly. I don't understand when we have NATO member states like uh, uh, Romania, uh, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Turkey, and others. So I don't understand why countries with two thirds uh, uh, of world economy. Uh, also, NATO, three countries with nuclear power. They are not behaving in the way that Russia will not just respect, but will withdraw all their troops from Russia, from Ukrainian territory. And what we are, uh, keep reading now, uh, I also visited India, and uh, there were many talks about 
global crisis is food, fuel, fertilizers. But never in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Energy, they never mentioned Russia as an aggressor state. Uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine was as mentioned as an uncomfortable situation. Ukraine was not invited to the G G20 summit. I do believe next year in Brazil, there we will find solutions that Ukraine will be present there. But actually, uh, um, uh, Senator Kunz, since we know each other for many years, so I, I, I really admire your compliments that Ukrainian armed forces are very creative, and we managed uh, to limit Russian presence that we can export the grain, but actually we need more attack arms because every day millions of people are. The situation is worsening with food supply. We cannot wait and discuss. And what I'm reading in American press now about containment. Some experts saying that we have to redefine the victory. Those, the same experts which were telling us in 2015 that Ukraine should sit and negotiate and not ask for weapon. Eight years of, of peaceful settlement, of political diplomatic ways of solving Russian aggression resulted in what? In Russia committing genocide against Ukraine. When we finally will learn the lessons, lessons from last century, from Holodomor as a genocide, and lessons from current Russian aggression. And even more, since I visited Taiwan, I see these connections. Uh, Non-recognition Holodomor as a genocide, then Holocaust uh, during Hitler time, then also when Taiwan, the Republic of China, was also, I would like to say, betrayed, and actually uh, someone wanted to appease uh, a communist regime in Beijing. And now it seems like the history for me, Ukraine, Middle East, and we are talking about Indo-Pacific Taiwan. The same, the same. Ukraine was sacrificed at that time. Now Ukrainian heroes are sacrificing their life. And I'm traveling almost 10 years. Can you imagine 10 years of my life? One first of my life I'm dedicating to defeat Russia and de-imperialize. And I, I really believe in victory. Otherwise, I cannot explain my daughter. Because before the full-scale war, when I was in the assassination list, and my daughter was forced to leave Ukraine, I was staying with my husband in our guinea pig in Kyiv. So actually, my daughter asked me a question at the border, Ukraine-Polish border. Mom, you were so proud that you know all Western leaders. You show me pictures with uh, Vice President Biden, with Prime Minister Trudeau, with Chancellor Merkel. And after eight years, why? All these Western leaders didn't help Ukraine to win, and now I have to leave Ukraine. And honestly, I was crying at that time. Because at that time, I was talking to my daughter and didn't know that if I survive. Because Russia was attacking, and my decision was to stay and defend my country in Kyiv. And at that time, it was like farewell conversations that you never will talk with your daughter again. So this is why my question, and after now ten, two years, I traveled already to 20 countries. For some countries like United States, five times. To Brussels, to Taiwan, to South Korea. And I don't understand what else is needed to convince the West that victory is in your interest as well. That this is not just we Ukrainians asking to help us, give us weapons, give us finally to win, give us this chance. What is the strategic value of Ukraine? It's our people. We don't want to receive F-16 when there will be no pilots anymore in Ukraine. Or attack arms when Russia will destroy all terminals, when half of country will be destroyed. This will not be victory anymore. So I'm really, I'm so thankful to Peter because making Ukraine victory as a main issue of this Halifax. Maybe this will be the idea that no appeasement to aggressor, no this uh, settlement, what we are keep hearing and others. Please give hope to my daughter not to be disappointed in Western democracy. It's also your credibility. R your reliability is at stake. Hannah, I think um, that very powerful testimony is a very good spot to pivot and to take, as I promised, questions from the audience. So I'm going to um, hand shot up straight away. Um, I don't know where the microphones are. Mm. They are arriving, hopefully. There's a question right at, at the front here. Come with the microphone. Thank you. 
Thank you. Paula Dobriansky, Harvard University. First, I want to echo and underscore, Hannah, your words. Peter is brilliant that you did make the theme of this Halifax victory in Ukraine and have tied every single panel and discussion to that because there are many of us who want to see that victory in Ukraine and it has to be repeated, repeated and repeated. So I did want to underscore that and congratulate and thank you. My question is to Hannah and to the Senator and that's actually about China. China, interestingly enough, does depend a sizable amount of its own imports and grain on Ukraine. It's an odd and interesting position. Zelensky called Xi, and when he called Xi, he actually raised the question of the abduction of, of uh, the children and asked for China's help in that case. The Chinese said they'd review, but there's been nothing. Do you think there's any leverage in this particular case relative to food and food security, especially because their own imports, there's a high percentage of their own imports impacted actually by the uh, blockade and the diminishment of grain coming out of Ukraine? There's a, a web of connections, um, some benign, some genuinely uh, malevolent. Um, Iran is producing the same drones uh, that are being used to attack civilians uh, in uh, Israel and in Russia. Um, China um, plays a central role in so many aspects of these uh, different conflicts. Um, I hadn't really focused on this uh, before, that one of the possible avenues of leverage for President Zelensky and the Ukrainians to seek assistance uh, with China is to say, we continue to provide you with critically needed foodstuffs. Um, keeping China from providing weapons to Russia has been one of our most important uh, sort of geostrategic priorities, something that we've used a whole range of countries uh, to over and over give the message to China, stay out of this war. They've come right up against the edge of it. Uh, and my hope is that Zelensky's plea can produce both um, help uh, with pulling back uh, China from engaging in the war. Frankly, the brutality, the, the cruelty, uh, of ad abducting thousands of Ukrainian children is just one of many ways uh, in which Putin has shown his intention to try and erase Ukrainian identity. Uh, what our vice president uh, at the Munich Security Conference last year called out clearly on the world stage is a genocide. So um, do I think that particular appeal will be the one that will make uh, Putin stop uh, this aggression? I, I don't, frankly. Um, but I do think providing more weapons uh, that are more sophisticated in a timely and relevant way is exactly what we need to do to provide Ukraine with a forceful message that will allow them to move forward to victory. Yes, sure. Thanks very much. Do you want to? So uh, for me personally, um, China is part of Russian aggression against Ukraine. China supporting Russia feeding not just with humanitarian aid. Maybe some experts prefer to say that this is only humanitarian aid. Or technologies and together with Iran. And I think this is really uh, important. Krink's uh, session was really about authoritarian mafia style club, which are supporting each other. And uh, I do believe with victory of Ukraine, we will not see Chinese investment. Because I think uh, China uh, is an enemy for uh, democracy, and not just as a communist regime in last century, and what they are doing now with Uyghurs. And I think Ukraine, which we are fighting for our rights, we should also not to tolerate the repressions that are happening in China, and it's really important uh, to mention this. The same like what's happening in the persecution of indigenous people inside Russia, the same. So I think Ukraine role in 21st century, not just as a breadbasket of the world. We have to become, how to say in English, a spiritual basket when dignity, freedom for everyone, this is the value of Ukraine victory. This is not just about restoring territorial integrity, returning back Crimea. No, it's much wider. Because I cannot, for example, when I saw the case when uh, uh, a scientist in the age of 82 from Udmurtia made 
four years ago an act of self-immolation because of uh, uh, persecution and uh, actually no allowance to, to have Udmurtia language. That's in, in Russia. That's in Russia. Russia clear, this yeah. is in Russia, 21st century, self-immolation in Udmurtia. So this really, I cannot accept this. So this is why Ukraine's mission in 21st century is much wider, much bigger. Mm. And we cannot just simply watch what's happening in China and uh, to keep silent. Yeah, I'm Jamie, just can want to bring I you something? in on China because I think it's been relevant to your work, isn't it, in China and, and fisheries? Yeah, I want to add something to Senator Coons and Hannah's comments, but also acknowledge how difficult it is to speak about anything on this panel, hearing the stories from Hannah. Uh, so, so we'll try, but it, we empathize and sympathize. Um, the, the weaponization and the investment that goes in to make food part of geopolitics and strategy is something that we really, really need to take seriously here. And um, in the domain of China and in the domain of Russia and other countries, we are seeing a concerted efforts of legislatively, with economic subsidies, protection of military and hard and soft security resources around the world, on the world's oceans, to lay claim, dominate, uh, and to access blue foods and terrestrial food for use in very powerful way now and into the future. And we need to understand better this sort of bro brewing challenges that we're going to face in the Indo-Pacific region that was discussed on the previous panel, in the Arctic, where there is a requirement for, for governance in other areas. And if you want to talk about indigenous and local communities, they're going to suffer tremendously unless we get a, to the left of the problem in terms of foreign incursions in that part of the world and resources. The Gulf of Guinea is another major challenge uh, of, of foreign fleets and foreign actors coming in and pillaging these areas without much governance and transparency. So we're seeing it in, uh, in, in Ukraine today, but we're going to see this type of warfare uh, over and over again if we don't put resources to it. And, and Esther, just briefly bring you in about the impact that the starvation that you talked to us, talk to us about is having in terms of security in Nigeria, in terms of fueling terrorism, criminal gangs, what, what kind of impact is that having? So um, again, it's a situation of from pan to fire. You know, um, already we had a, um, an insecurity problem uh, with Boko Haram, ISIS, ISWAP, all over Nigeria, and now um, with the war from Ukraine, there is a higher risk of food insecurity and a higher risk of um, young people joining criminal gangs in order to survive. That has already been mentioned. But I also think that um, more attention needs to be um, given to Africa um, to follow up with what Senator Chris said about um, the imbalance in the way immigrants are treated from Africa vis-a-vis, -vis, um, for example, Ukraine. It's also in the same way with the hostage-taking situation that happened um, um, with the Israelis, you know. And here we are in Nigeria. Nine years ago, 276 young girls were kidnapped from school, the Chibok girls. It's nine years ago. There are still 98 of them in captivity. Nobody talks about that anymore. 14 of these girls were rescued from the kidnappers' camp, and they returned with 24 children. And they have parents, you know, they have to stay with their parents. There's stigma now on the children as children of kidnappers or terrorists, and so they're not accepted or assimilated back into the society. And parents are grappling with, who is the father of my grandchild? He's a terrorist, you know? So um, I, I think more attention needs to be given to Africa. You know, like there's an outrage on the Israeli kidnap um, hostage taking that just happened. That kind of outrage needs to be expressed with what's also going on in Africa. Otherwise, we're going to lose the, the, the whole governance structure of Africa to non-state actors and see nothing done about that. Thanks, Esther. Um, there's lots of hands going up. So I want to go towards the back. Gentleman at the back. Mm -hmm. 
um, Tolu Ogunlesi uh, from Nigeria. Um, uh, well, I, I think my question is uh, to Senator Kuntz, uh, being from the US. I, um, it's one thing to sort of talk about how um, Ukraine um, or the invasion of Ukraine is affecting food security in the world. It's another thing to think about the opportunities that this presents to invest in food production in places like Nigeria. You know, so um, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts sort of on what the US, uh, for example, could be doing. So for example, in Nigeria, um, urea exports became our largest um, non-oil exports last year, in 2022. Mm -hmm. You know, um, overtaking sesame seeds and all that. A lot of that urea actually comes to the US and other places. So there's, there's room for all these investments. You know, so how much is the US thinking about sort of like putting money behind the, you know, the words to just make sure that we're not just complaining, we're also um, making sure that, you know, we're building a capacity for the future. Thank you. And thank you for the question. Um, there are huge opportunities for innovation in the agricultural space uh, on the continent. Um, after the Munich Security Conference, uh, a bipartisan group of senators went and visited uh, five countries across Africa. And in almost every stop, one of the issues was exactly this. How can the continent that has the majority of the arable land on Earth that is not currently being farmed, or on which fish are not currently being raised, to his point about blue foods, how can we work with African communities and leaders to find innovative paths? I didn't realize uh, that the fertilizer crisis was in a, some real part being met from Nigerian exports. We don't in any way want to supplant Ukrainian exports. Uh, we need to make sure that there is robust market opportunity uh, for Ukraine, for uh, edible oils, and for grain going forward as they come out of this uh, horrible period of Russian aggression. But this is also one of the few ways that we have real promise to feed a hungry planet. Climate change is causing fish stocks to migrate. It's also impacting where you can grow food and what kind of food. The foundation that Senator Graham and I are trying to create would mobilize innovation to deliver new hybrids, new, new styles of production, and to innovate in terms of where and how um, food is being produced and exported around the world. Thank you for the question. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Um, I'm going to go the back there. Mm. And then. Thank you very much. I have a question. I'm Nabe Watanabe from Tokyo, Japan. And I have a question to James. The reason is that the, it's a very curious how this information campaign was uh, collaborated between Russia and China. The experience of Japan recently, you may know that Japan uh, discharged the water from a Fukushima nuclear plant. And the IAEA clearly said that no risk, uh, no risk of, of the water the, with the scientific data. But uh, China banned uh, the import from, of uh, seafood from Japan. And uh, not many people follow because they believe the IAEA, scientific data. But uh, very recently, Russia joined China to ban seafood. So I'm curious, the collaboration between China and Russia on uh, this, this information campaign, especially the food security. Thank you. Jamie, Jamie, do you want me to take that one? I think you meant me, yeah. <laughs> um, I, think, I think I understood you. What does the data say, and how can we use it, and how, what does a, a holistic approach to this problem look like? Look, we have, fortunately, at WWF, put together a team, not only of environmental scientists, but social scientists uh, and ocean scientists. Um, and the innovation that we are bringing to the world is integration. It's been very, very siloed. It's been buried in academic literature. And what we wanted to do was to integrate and visualize a global map of where future threats looks like for two reasons. Number one, we need to elevate the political awareness. Chris Kuhn has been a champion of this. We need you know, all 535 members of Congress to understand the threat that this poses to American interest. Secondly, we need to give appropriators and those who can build capacity around the world a little bit more time to, uh, to, to put the resources where they're needed in a holistic way, including both defense and conservation forces, 
uh, and then respond in, in all sorts of ways from deterrence to natural resource management. And finally, there are some better players and there are some worse players in this space. And we need to shine a light on both of those players and bring together a consortium or a coalition around this space. And what's better to have a coalition around than, than food? Everyone is impacted. It has tremendous human and geopolitical consequences. And so that's where I think we need to bring this conversation. And I think this conversation here today has, has helped that. And I'm thankful. Thank you, Johan. At uh, the front here. Thank you. My name is uh, Ido Moed. I'm Israel's ambassador to Canada. Um, I have an observation. I'll be very happy to hear your thoughts about that. In my mind, uh, victory in Ukraine goes through Africa in many more ways than just about food. Uh, Africa can, uh, has the potential to feed itself and to provide food, as you just said, Senator, to the other parts of the world. But it needs to be looked at as an asset and not as a liability. Um, in many ways, um, uh, Russia is abusing its powers in Africa to uh, get access to raw materials, to gold, and circumvent sanctions and use it in ways that actually prevent us from uh, achieving that victory. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Thank you. Who'd like to take that on? You, um, let me just say, yeah, I totally agree with you. There are opportunities. Um, but I also think that one of the major issues we're contending with in Africa, uh, I speak for my country, is bad governance. You know, and if we can get uh, governance right, I think those opportunities will have an enabling environment to be more productive. I think one of the most uh, important initiatives from the United States and other allied countries is combating corruption. Uh, Russia uses blatant corruption uh, in order to influence uh, elites in countries uh, where they then uh, either facilitate a coup or engage in extractive industries. Your average person on the street knows that they are not benefiting from the resources of the nation in which they live. And when the United States talks about democracy, that doesn't move people as much as saying we're going to insist on ending corruption, promoting transparency, and ensuring that you get the benefit of the country in which you live. These are two sides of the coin in terms of addressing bad governance. Mm -hmm. But uh, Russia uses corruption, violence, and force. And in Africa is a particularly pernicious force because of it. Weak governance needs to be met uh, with strong governance. And that requires good development partners from the West and from the United States in particular. Thank you very much. Um, over here, the law. Hi, I'm Koshin Bathmax. Oh. I'm one of the. Oh, sorry. Over there. It was. Sorry. sorry. Uh, I'm Koshin. I'm one of the 15 at 15 winners, and my question was: as, as youth, we grew up hearing about food insecurity. S since we grew up, it's been every day, everywhere. So, what would you tell us as we move into positions of power in the future? Sorry. Don't know who wants to take that on. <laughs> what What will you tell the youth about? food security. Maybe Senator Coons a quick one from you. Um, I'd say you're, you're, you're a young man. You can, yeah. I, if I look young, that's a remarkable thing. Only in the US Senate am I considered. <laughs> <laughs> My occasional visits to the senator's only gym are invigorating. <laughs> but um, I, I, I would say stay hungry for change. Um, be insistent on um, not forgetting um, the sense of um, compassion and concern you have uh, for billions of people around the world who go to bed hungry, who don't know where their next meal is coming from, who are on the move or um, suffering because of climate change and conflict. Um, and when young people uh, raise their voices for the importance of addressing climate change, addressing injustice, they're also contributing to addressing food insecurity. So keep at it and keep making great videos. <laughs> unfortunately, that is, I'm very sorry, unfortunately we've run out of time, but I'm sure uh, the panelists would be very happy to take your questions personally. But uh, it just leaves me to thank everyone for this uh, fascinating panel, to, to Hannah Hopko, 
to Senator Chris Coons, to uh, Pastor Esther Ibanga, and to Johan Berganas. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you all very much indeed as well.